Next up, we have David McComas of NASA Goddard presenting a workshop on core flight system application development. Uh, David's uh, another longtime friend of the Flight Software Workshop, and we're glad to welcome him back. Oh, thanks, Brandon. You oh, okay, thanks. And um, thanks for everybody uh, tuning in. Um, so I actually retired from Goddard, NASA Goddard, in 2019, and I've been enjoying my retirement um, trying to help out the community adopt the CFS. So I've got a website called OpenSat Kit, and um, today I'm going to have a new tool, and I appreciate everybody being willing to participate. And I thank the workshop for giving me, you know, this opportunity because they, they were looking for some ideas, you know, with demos and also with hands-on workshops. And we all know how that can go. Even a demo can be hard, but I, there's been a challenge trying to set up a tool that we can actually do it together. And hopefully this will work out. And I hope I ask for your patience as well. Um, so this is actually going to be at the application level. And I also want to mention that Joe Hickey's online. Um, this, this particular tool involves a electronic data sheet tool chain. And he worked at NASA Glenn who had developed the tool chain. So this is combining a lot of technology, which is I think um, working out pretty well. If people tuned into Chris's uh, keynote this morning, he mentioned about especially C CFDP, the file transfer, the kind of APL's evolution through the years and adopting technology. Well, CFS, the electronic data sheets is part of it in a sense. Some of the definitions are there, but the tool chain's not integrated. So I kind of look at this, this current effort as a way to help bridge that adoption level. Um, so maybe take us from the, you know, the, the current practice, maybe at least show where it can go. And today is just gonna be a little glimpse into that. Um, and I think with that, I will move on. Oh, right, man, I guess you guys, I gotta share my screen, sorry. <laughs> I'm driving the screen. So let me, uh, you missed the introductory slide. And oh, I, while I'm doing this, I guess I'd like to point out that Alan Cudmore, so this will be at the application level, and Alan Cudmore on Thursday will be doing importing the CFS to the RTEMS or to RTEMS. So that'll get you at the platform level, an example. So hopefully the two are pretty complementary. Um, so what, what I, my goals here are the guide, you know, participants, and even if you're not doing a hands-on, hopefully you'll find it valuable just to see the process of creating and running a core flight system application. Um, I'm going to introduce a couple technical concepts. I don't know everybody who's on, you know, what your level of experience is. So this was really hard to, you know, to come up with a, a baseline. So I'll introduce some concepts and with the, with the exercises, it'll be more just to, um, you know, you, you can't get a deep understanding, but you'll be, you know, be able to mechanically go through them. Um, so it's really going to be, you know, I got a couple introductory slides. And then I'll jump into the hands-on. So we'll go over the, the framework for the core flight system. Um, actually, I don't have any good slides. Electronic data sheet, I have one slide on, but I can explain some things as we're going through the example. And then um, and also the OpenSAT kit. I have for OpenSAT kit, um, I have my own CFS kind of framework within that in the apps that I've written for OpenSAT kit. They haven't flown, but the framework is there. Um, I've done a couple things that I think one make more modular apps, but um, two also made it a little easier for um, quick rapid prototyping by using JSON tables as opposed to binary tables. So I took a little different path than the, the um, open source Goddard app suite. Um, as I mentioned, I'll have a short introduction. Um, then after CFS SAT is installed, uh, we can run the ground system and then the launch tutorials from there. So my hope there is that I'm going to be doing it with you and everybody else that has installed the kit, you can, you know, you can go back and forth. If I'm going to try to go slow and do a couple things and then ask for questions and make sure we try to stay synced. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I've tried to minimize, you know, prerequisites. Um, we are going to, at the very last step, if we get there, we'll do a little C coding um, after the auto generation of the code. Um, so, but you won't have to know, you can cut and paste from other areas. So you don't have to be a C programmer. Um, and, but just, so you don't have to have a detailed knowledge of any of the technology underneath that really will be um, more of like a cookbook approach. And so just a couple versioning notes, um, cause this is important. The, the NASA, NASA um, has released a core flight executive that they call Kalem, the current, right now it's a pre-release. 
And the electronic data sheet tool chain works with that pre-release of Kalum. There are app suites out there. The app, the Goddard app suite, most of those apps other than CFDP have not been upgraded. The open source release is not compatible with Kalum. So I just want to make that clear that, um, you know, the, the, the framework that we're going through, you just, unfortunately at this point in time, you can't just pull a bunch of apps down. Um, what I am doing in OpenSAT Kit, I've created another repo called OpenSAT Kit App Repo, where I'm individually configuration controlling the apps, and they will be Kalem compatible as I as I mature those. Um, the CFSAT, this new Python or the whole kit together that I'm calling it right now, is a beta release. Um, I'm hoping it it, it hold water all the test drip, um, drives I've given it, so hopefully it'll behave today. Um, I mentioned the, C, uh, the framework. Um, there's also a demo app there that was I was hoping to get to. It, it actually loads and runs and all that, but I doubt we're gonna have time to play with that. Um, and OpenSAT Kit itself, which I won't get into, is uh, it's a separate kit that has Cosmos, CFS, and 42 Simulator. That's using the Aquila CFS. So that's a different version, and those apps are not, again, compatible with the Kalum. Um, let's see. I think that's all I want to say there. Sorry, I have my second screen blocking a little bit. So, so here's the agenda. We, I mentioned we'll do a quick introduction of some technologies. Um, there's also, then I was going to go through the installation, but if there's people that haven't, so what's happened to date, some people have already tried to pre-install CFS set. And I would recommend, even as I'm making some of these introductory slides, if you want to go ahead and try the installation, it's at the website below. And real quick, I can bring up, um, here's the website. And on the readme file, there's a set of prerequisites that uh, I've written the commands for um, Ubuntu. And uh, if you got another platform, hopefully, the, the, plat, the packages will have similar names, um, but I don't have all the different uh, operating system permutations here. And for, if you're on Ubuntu, you can certainly just, it's, you can just cut and paste these and, and, and the installation doesn't take long. A lot of it's some um, standard, you know, for developers, some of the C, but this does get into an XML, Lua, JSON and Python. So it needs um, a fair number of libraries, but again, it's fairly quickly. The only other um, package that I depend on is um, something called PySimple GUI, which I I recommend. I, I ran across it, and it's a it's a superset of many Python GUIs, and the, the the authors made it very easy. Yeah, he calls it GUIs for humans, and um, it's it's very easy to use, and so that's what I've gone there, and then um, the next step will be the clone repository. But, uh, and then we'll run, but we're gonna do a little different order here. Like I said, I'll, I'd rather run the Python and then step into a build and run CFS tutorial. So a couple background, you know, a couple introductory technical slides. So the CFS, if you're not familiar with it, it's a layered architecture. And so it has two layers, the o operating system abstraction layer abstracts the um, operating system um, out of the box. It runs on a Linux machine. And then you also have the platform support layer. And that abstracts, you know, parts that are outside, you know, if you go into memory or the timer chips or things like that, you know, more board specific interfaces. Then there's the core flight executive and that has um, services that basically create a runtime environment for applications. So you have executive service, you got time service, um, and the big one, you got event service. But the real, the modularity of um, CFS really comes from the software bus, we call it. And that's really a published, subscribed messaging system. And um, that's really the bread and butter of creating apps. And as we'll see that the electronic data sheets, what, what they are is a CCSDS standard that lets you specify interface specifications. So you can package your, you can define your command and telemetry and tables using electronic data sheets. And um, that's um, what this tool chain and the apps that are in it um, do. 
And then there's the other terminology called CFS framework. I don't know if it's technically called CFE or CFS tech framework. I guess I should know, but, um, and that's, that's what was labeled Kalo. So the APIs that are defined by a CFE framework release and by the NASA cons configuration control board, those are what's important that I was mentioning in the versioning. So NASA also publishes what they call CFS bundle. Um, and that includes a command ingest app, a telemetry output app, and a scheduler app. And I'm going to explain their roles in a second if you're not familiar with the runtime environment. And so basically at the third level, we have applications and libraries that um, that really give you the functionality. And in the last presentation, you know, there was the analogy between a smartphone, which um, is a good one for this to a degree, but CFS is that we actually have very coupled apps as well. And that's what's always kind of confusing sometimes because you get this framework and now you've got to combine and build these apps to work as a system. And that kind of documentation sometimes can be um, a little, you know, not clear, I'll say. Um, so, so the other, you know, just, again, just enough to get to the, the hands-on. I mentioned that the, um, the sulfur bus is the predominant service and there's also OpenStack Kit does have some other CFS documentation. So outside of this, you can go there and get some. And so does the CFS from NASA. So basically the terminology is the sending app sends a, a message on the bus. And these are CCSDS messages. Um, so that's a, for, if you're not familiar, it's a standardization board that um, has defined space data systems. And they have a packet definition for commands and tele, or telemetry. Um, then you have a, a receiving app creates a pipe and that pipe is a FIFO queue, first in, first out. So when a sending app sends a message, it gets queued on the pipe and then the receiving app can either pend or pull on a pipe, depending on what they need. So they can receive the, um, app. It's a broadcast model. So the sending apps don't need to know who's subscribed to their message. Um, they just put out the messages and the receiving app can, um, um, use the message. And one is from an interface point of view, what's important there is that the receiving app, if it's going to do any processing of the payload on the message, it needs to know the payload definition. And that's also another important aspect of um, electronic data sheets of publishing that. So as I mentioned, there's a command, this is an important runtime, I call it the runtime context or, and, and basically this is a minimum set of apps. That's why they bundle them you need for a system. Because uh, command ingest, you need to receive it from an external source. Typically it's the ground system, but it could be from another processor on board. It's gonna take messages from that source. Um, and if they're framed, you've gotta have another app or the command ingest, take the messages out of the frame, publish them on the software bus. This double lined arrow is our convention for software bus and send it to the app. And similarly, the app's gonna generate telemetry and telemetry outputs the app that takes that telemetry from the software bus and puts it out to an external system. Um, these ports are the names or the numbers that are used by um, CFSAT. And another concept, and this can sometimes be a little confusing because it's not necessarily documented from a system's point of view. Um, creating synchronous embedded systems is um, very beneficial, especially in a satellite that might have 20 or 30 apps. And if you're working around a control law that operates at a certain system and you got some other science payloads that are collecting data at certain rates. And if you want to do load balancing on your system or repeatable tests and things like that, it's very helpful to have a synchronized system. So the mechanism that CFS uses is to have an at the app level. So this is different than the operating system scheduler. It's a scheduler app, which is typically one of the highest priorities. And it basically has a table of messages that it's gonna send at predetermined times. So a second can be divided up into however many slots that you wanna divide it into. And the scheduler app is gonna send messages on the software bus to wake up apps that wanna run in that way. So an app can pend on, a mess, on the message bus and wait for a scheduler message to wake up. And the messages can also occur, they don't have to be sub seconds, they can occur across seconds. So you can have one message every three or four seconds. And that's another very common design pattern is for each app to have what we call a housekeeping packet. 
telemetry packet, I'm sorry. So, and what that is, is just basic status for an application. So um, you would have a housekeeping request in the scheduler table to say, so let's say it's every four seconds and said, send your housekeeping request. So application would wake up when it receives that and say, oh, I better send my telemetry packet, which would then get put out on the bus, received by telemetry output and sent to the ground system. So the other parts I consider runtime, which we haven't gotten, and they're not here and not in the demo yet, um, are file systems. Now that, you know, CFS is built around file systems. So you really need file manager and a file transfer um, app. And that that actually is the next step I want for CFS that to have in it. So here's a, a very common um, flow chart for the top level um, flow of an application. Um, and like I said, not all of them need to pen. But uh, so initialization, we like to do a lot of the resource allocation and things through an initialization. So a, an app would subscribe, create the pipe, subscribe to the messages it needs, and then it enters this infinite loop. So if you let's this app example is it's pending indefinitely on a bus. So imagine it's just sitting there. If they've met the execute message comes from the software bus, it'll say, yep, I got to execute and I'll perform my functions. And if it, the message is not executed, it says, oh, should I send my telemetry? Yes, let's go send it. Um, and another convention here, we call this the housekeeping cycle, because it, a lot of times you might have a background thing you might want to do every three or four seconds. That um, it's a nice time period to do these kind of housekeeping things. So that's that's another term you'll hear in the CFS. And, and like, if it's not a, you know, one of these two, it could be a ground, it should be a ground system command, otherwise you get an error. Um, then the user's process to ground command. So that's kind of the flow. Um, and that's all I had for the introduction. So that gives you a basic app for a CFS app. And we'll get in more as we go through, as we um, step through things. Um, the only thing I have here on before we jump down is electronic data sheets. So these files on the left are artifacts, you know, so you can define your command it's telemetry. And they go into a tool chain at compile time. And this can create your header files and it can create some other um, type definition files and things you need for the flight software, as well as it creates, it can create Lua and bindings, um, Python bindings that can be used by a ground system and or flight. And um, so in, in CFSAT at the moment, like I said, it's just a early stages, it's using the Python bindings to get the information that you'll see in the GUI in a second. And, and as a disclaimer, the OpenSAT kit apps are only partially here. Right now, there's, they're not fully utilizing the EDS. The, the command ingest, telemetry output, and scheduler apps are fully utilizing the um, EDS. Um, but the OpenSAT kit ones, I'm in process of upgrading them to be fully EDS. Um, I won't say compliant, just utilize all the features of the EDS that's, that's available. So that's that's the EDS side. So this is the basic screen of um, the, there's a Python ground system tool. And I just wanted to kind of highlight things we will be using. Um, so there's a create app tool under apps, and that's that's a tool that's going to create the Hello World app. And right now it's actually template based. So it's fairly easy to add some templates for other types of apps in, in a particular directory. So my goal is to populate that, especially with the, um, the pattern that's used by the, the, this EDS framework that we'll see. Then um, we have tutorials and these are just kind of, they're more like slideshows. Um, they're just ping files that get, can be, um, scrolled through and that's what I'm going to use so we can kind of work together but it also give you the flexibility to go back and forth if you need to we will not be using these start and stop CFS buttons um, they let you run the CFS as a sub process of a Python but that doesn't give you visibility into the the, um, the terminal window from any messages from the CFS so that's not very helpful today I have um, this one drop down is some configuration commands and these are just little simple things 
Yeah, we got one, we have to enable telemetry every time you start the CFS. The TO app is not always just blasting telemetry. So you need to actually enable it. And there's other convenience things like um, you can reset time and you can actually change, you know, it gives you a quick access to like the event message service to change, enable or disable particular event types. Then we have uh, send commands and, and receive telemetry. And these drop downs, as you can see, these long names, these names are taken directly from the electronic data sheets. That, um, so this is, this is core flight exec services, application, there's other, you, there's other categories here, and then it's a command. And then likewise, there's the, the term topic is used. Um, and we, we can get into that if we need to. And, and the, the, the status window right now, this is really a placeholder. It's really just a scrolling text window. Eventually, I would like to build up some you know, common status that would be useful to have, maybe in a more telemetry-oriented way. But right now, it's just scrolling. And then this bottom window is um, event messages from both flight and ground. So I mentioned um, installation. Um, if, so if people are going through it, what I think I'll do is pause here for a second to see if there's any questions about installation, and then we can um, move on from there. So maybe I'll take a little breather and see if anybody, I guess the process here, I'm not sure if there's somebody monitoring um, hand raising and then they could just forward to questions or. We don't uh, currently have any questions. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I would say that if you have a question, type it in Q&A and then I can call it out. I think okay. that's probably the easiest uh, than monitoring 215 right. hands. <laughs> uh, so let's let's just go with that. And if, if you have any questions, uh, pop them in the Q&A. Uh, the, the other thing that I'm monitoring is that uh, CFS workshop channel in Slack. Um, so go check that out as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then I'm not gonna wait here and, and I don't mind being interrupted anytime. So that's, that's fine. I, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna jump then to my VM system. Um, I wasn't gonna reissue these instructions um, on my machine and I didn't start with a blank sheet so I'm going to go ahead and go in and and we can run these commands together to start the application so and this is where you know I encourage those to follow along that are doing it and please don't hesitate you know if if something's not working don't you know this is a this is the first time for me as well, trying to do something live and hands-on. So I'm more than happy to stumble through this with you. Uh, so, so I've got two terminal windows open. I, I, I guess I'll choose the, the left one. I will do, and they're both at where I installed CFSAP. So I'm gonna change directory to the ground system and then app directory. Oops. And so, so here you're going to see it's just a Python application called CFSAT, and then there's a, a shell um, file called setvars. We're going to run that, and there is a space there. And this is only defining one variable. I, you got to define the path to the um, to the Python bindings that was is going to be created. Oh, I just thought of a chicken and egg problem. Here, here's our first, uh, got, so I have the tutorial. I think what we're gonna have to do is, um, yeah, we'll have to take the, it, it defines the path to the library, but the library hasn't been created yet because we haven't gone through the compile time. So that's all right. We'll still go ahead and start the, um, the tool. So Python 3, CF, whoops, got the extension. And those are just some debug messages. So here's the tool. And the, so now from here, we can launch, this is where people can work along that have installed it, build and run the CFS tutorial. So this just gives you a little um, objectives of the tutorial 
and there's only one lesson in it. So it's already selected. So we can just say start. And like I said, these are just slides that, that are going to help you go through the tutorial with me or yourself. So they're really intended to be, um, you should be able to do them on your own as well. So one thing to note here, so here's the CFS set or CF set directory structure. It really has two main, I mean, here's the framework. So this is the tool chain that's from Glenn that Joe Hickey is maintaining. It has an apps directory that we won't go in, but these are all the lab apps. The other key directory here is when it when you run a CMake, it's gonna build, I don't know why I have it a little, a little bit like this. So the build XE CPU one, so the green goes, that's where it's going to be. Um, we're going to run the CFS from, um, but we're going to, well, why not I step through, I'll go through it at the same time. So David, can you repeat the, the last command that you just sent? Sorry, um, the Python, uh, yes. It was to start the ground system was Python three uh, space CFS set dot PY. And if you had trouble with that, it, it should give you an error. If you hadn't run set bars, it will say that the path is not defined. Okay, so I will, I'm now in, um, so th th this is building and running the CFS. So now I'm in, in CFS set. So we're gonna change directory to the framework, um, we're gonna issue the make simulation. That's one good thing being a bad typist. I can, um, oops, oh my goodness, I forgot prep. <laughs> the, the, the slide doesn't have, It's it's gotta be make simulation prep. So it's right on the website, but wrong in the slide. Apologies for that. So this is the right command. Um, and what this is doing, it's gonna prepare the, um, for building the, the CFS. So if all goes well, you should see at the end of the, you know, you should see messages like this, configuration done, generation done, build files have been written to this build directory. And then it echoes your configuration variables. So that's, hopefully that's all going well. Then you see the, if we want to run the CFD, uh, change directory, four.cpu1. So now what's just happened here is the CFS has been started, or this, it's really the framework that started. And we'll, we'll, we'll see this in a second. There's another file called startup or CFE underscore executive or ES underscore startup script. That is, um, told, that identifies which libraries and apps to load at runtime. So if we go, um, these are CFE versions. Let's, I'm trying to find a line. in here that so there's a line in here that says that, that it read the file successfully um without finding that oh there it is right here so it's got the startup file and then here's um a library called assert here's one the OSKC framework it's loading command in just lab it's loading the, the all the it's identifying all the ad um you know the the apps that it's running and and then the, the other convention is apps will often or should put out an event message. So like the demo app says it's initialized to version 4.0. So we usually do an event message that then identifies the version, which is very helpful. So you know that you're really <laughs> loading what you think you're loading. Um, so these, the start and stop flywheels, those are events that are from our time services. And the, um, basically it's that we're running on a desktop in a Linux and it's not, it's not, aligning to the one hertz pulse to an accuracy. So it, it, it says it's entering flywheel mode that it's not trying to sync anymore. So that's really what that message means. What I've done when I enable telemetry, I also add a filter 
to time services. So we don't, we won't see that message anymore. Um, it's, it can be annoying. <laughs> so, so hopefully people are getting the CFE up and running or CFS. Um, so going to the next, the, this is where we've got our chicken and egg. Well, we can go through some of this, but eventually we're gonna have to shut down the Python and restart it. So it's, it's linked to the library. So, so here's just a slide describing what I mentioned. So in, in this direct, and there's another key directory called cfsat underscore defs. And this is where you, um, there's two key files here. A lot of important files here in that directory. Targets.cmake is where you define what files or what directories should be built for the libraries and the apps. And then the startup script defines which apps should be loaded. Um, and another thing to point in, the, you can configure the CMake system to look in other directories. And CFSAT's set up so it'll look in the libs directory from for some libraries. And also this next directory. CFSAT, CFS apps is outside of the framework. And this is another directory where um, I've been adding apps so I don't have to, you know, I don't worry about the um, disrupting the core bundle app. So if I do an update of the, my goal is right now, this framework's not a subtree, but I want it to be a subtree. So my goal is not to, you know, to easily be update the sub, the framework. So any apps that CFS, CFSAT, <laughs> adds they're going to be in this directory so here's the startup script an example of it or part of it so there's the object type is it a library or an app it's path and file name and right now it's just looking in a, a subdirectory of called cf I think a compact flash that is looking for the um object files then your entry symbol which is in the c and we'll see an example then this is the flight software name. This is the priority that's going to be on the underlying operating system, nothing to do with the scheduler app, and then the stack size. Um, and I think I went over the startup messages already. So this is, uh, we all saw the good, oh, this is a good startup. This is an unsuccessful startup sometimes, and I don't want to get too much because I realized we're already 27 minutes in. So. Um, you don't have to, as you saw, I didn't start with privilege mode, but if you have some issues, here's a slide to address that. So I do want to get some more of the hands on. So now I'm going to have to restart. We want to enable telemetry, but, um, well, actually we can see what it does, but I think that library, it's probably going to yell with a Python label, but maybe it's fine if it, let's try it. Yeah, so it didn't respond. So. We need to restart, unfortunately, the, the um, Python. Oops. Oh, it's got a timeout on the, oh, I left, oh, the right, the, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna control C out of here. Oops, if it lets me. <laughs> I guess the, let me just shut it down there. Oh. That's where the, there it goes. <laughs> So now I'm going to read this. So now the CFS is running in the right. That now the Python library, I didn't show you where that was, but now that's been, should be successful. So now the commands have gone out. And so we can see over in the CFS window, TO lab received the command to enable telemetry output. Just as the health and status I have, I'm just printing out, as I mentioned, this is not finished yet, but it's just from the housekeeping telemetry executive services time. So we can see that time is incrementing. Um, and actually you can tell that it's housekeeping packet is being requested every four seconds. This was the event window in the bottom. And so TO lab, and this, I mentioned that I, I turned off flywheel events, right? What I did was add an event filter, which um, stopped them from happening, which is kind of a cool feature of event services that you can do it. And just to show you, so here's the command menu. Um, so let's say you want to send um, a command. Now this, again, it's, it's work in progress. I'm learning Pi simple GUI. So I have, I had to set up a bunch of parameters without knowing the maximum parameter of any command. 
I was having a little time with this, this is my own programming of um, Pi simple GUI, but it's a way that worked. So I could get to the parameters. So let's say you wanted to, um, well, first we can do a no op command. So you should see the no op came out over here and it also came out in the GUI. And again, these, these drop downs are from the, the electronic data sheet. So if we brought up a command to, um, let's say, I think a good one, overwrite system log command. So this, what this is, this is a command that says there's a system log and it has two choices. I could discard or overwrite in the circular buffer. If I discard it, it'll rewrite itself. The details are not important. What's important is you can see the parameter name, the type, and then in the enumeration type. And all this is available because of the electronic data sheets, because they define the interface to this. So if you change that, this the GUI doesn't have to, I mean, it just reads the library and creates these screens from the from the information in electronic data sheets. And similarly, the telemetry topic, if we um, start, this will bring up another window. Again, it's not all pretty grand, it's not all, a lot of us are used to parameter in a little window. I found it easiest right now, just I'm printing out the electronic data sheets. So it literally is the executive services, the payload definition, and the name of the payload and the value. So we can see the command counter is up to one is because we issued the no op. So let's go back. I think that might be the end of build and run of tutorial. Let's see. So, so we've basically gone through the menus, um, gotten a feel for how things are structured. And I think I, I already went over this. So, I think that's good. Um, so again, if there's any questions or anybody's having any problems, please uh, raise your hand or shout out. So the next thing we're gonna do is do a create hello world app. And then there's a, just a little bit of, you know, tweaking the code a little bit. So the first lesson is to create the hello world app. And again, it's gonna be, uh, screens. So what's important here, so we're going to first use the tool that has a app template in this directory. So we're, that's CFS set, the ground system and templates. You don't really need that. That's the man behind the curtains kind of thing. And then when uh, we create the app, it's going to put it in this directory, CFS apps. And then in order to make the app available to the build system, we're going to have to edit the target make system and the startup script. So those are basically the three things we have to do and then rebuild the system. So and it might be easier just to, to show you. So the next stop, actually we don't need, we will need to stop the, we can do that now. Stop the CFS, might as well follow the instructions. So you can just control C, I'm in the window with the CFS, we just control C. Um, this stop button on the won't work because this is only when it's run from the start and it's a sub process. Um, so from the tool menu, if you go under apps, we have create app. Didn't have to focus. Nope. Uh -oh. Don't don't do this to me now. Well, it's supposed to come up. Oh, that's gonna. Hey Dave, I think that um, the the team actually has just seen this where the pop-ups do not work if the tutorial is open. Oh, interesting. Okay, thank you. Whoever uh, just that. Uh, Let's see if that fixed it. Yep, I that I can. Well, I don't have any other. Oh, I must have. Oh, maybe you know what? Let me take down a telemetry window too. Maybe I got some. Oh, that's that's still a tutorial. There we go. Yep, I can first first action item. <laughs> yeah, I got some nesting problems. Okay. So great. So I'm gonna eventually I want to have more templates. Um and then um so here 
you can bring up once you select one you can bring up a description um and this will just tell you what it's creating a hello world using the application and there's actually json files behind here and the idea is this that i really want to make this a minimalistic tool that's expandable by people so that's really it's a total opposite of OpenSat kit which is a monolithic <laughs> wow so this is kind of a lesson learned to become a more of a creative bottoms up tool so if we say create app it'll prompt for an application name and I'm going to recommend everybody just if you want to follow all the screens are written if, as if you just said hello and I'm putting all lowercase it'll still the template will still do mixed case and uppercase for different things um, and so that you don't really have to worry lowercase I know works I don't know if you put in all uppercase here I would hope it I have to look at it uh oh so I got an error of creating a directory so much for, you know, I did dry run this, but um, <laughs> let's try it again. I'm not sure why it's, might have to do some real time. Now it says, oh, that might've been up. You know what? I have to investigate that. I don't know if that was a real error. <laughs> so it just prompted me whether it wanted to overwrite the directory and I didn't go back to the directory to find out. So, and these really aren't, obviously aren't a flight software status. These are just some debug, but error creating. I'm not sure what's going on here. Let me, uh... I think that might be false. So here's the directory. I don't know if anybody else has seen this. I'm a little surprised. <laughs> I'd gone, so it's giving me, it's complaining, but it looks like it's creating all the files. So I'm not sure why I'm getting error messages, but I'll have to. That's why I'm glad I didn't call it release 1.0. So it's definitely a beta release, but it looks like they're all there. So that's a good thing. Well, that's, it might be a time to, so actually this might be a worth. So here's the hello file. There's an EDS file and I might as well open it real quick. I'm not gonna go through the details. So this is what the electronic data sheets look like. And basically you're gonna define your types and your packets and your command and telemetry packets and tables, if you'd like. So like I said, I, we don't have time to go through details, but happy to have conversations later. Um, then here's the flight software directory. And if people are familiar with that, it's the typical, nothing's new here, mission include platform, the source and tables are just example tables. And oh, that's the other thing we'll have to do. So don't want to jump ahead, but there are some, these tables, and I'll get to that step. These are, there's um, the OpenSAT kit framework has an initialization table, and it also has a parameter table. And as I mentioned, I use JSON. These will have to be copied into the, the CFSAT defs directory, but we'll get to that step. I don't want to confuse you. Okay, so now we've created the source code, regardless of the errors. Now am I going to have the opposite problem? Now it seems to, um, well, maybe I can do this from, uh, that's interesting. Obviously I've done a sequence I haven't done. Um, let me, sorry, I can bring up some slides. I'll, put, I'll still display my slides. Sorry about that. Um, um, obviously I have a little gooey you know what I'll try to do? I'll just bring it down and up again. That solves it. So, oops, sorry, wrong one. And Dave, just to make sure that you uh, were pacing right, we have about 15 minutes left. Okay, okay, let's get to the, Thank you. So let's at least get you the guys. So I promise at least a hello world. So we've gone through where the source code is. Um, so the, oh, that was the next step. So we really, so we got to copy. I'll just do it from the go. We got to copy these two files, the table files to the desk file. So these two files need to be copied to the framework. CFSAT, that's, I'm going to go here just to 
and paste. And if you notice, there's a, this is where the CPU startup is, and you can see all the other files. Then now we're going to go into the targets.cmake, which is in that same directory. So targets.cmake. So I'll go a little faster. I apologize. And if you go down to CPU one, there's an apt list um, function. So we can go and say hello. And then if we go under here, you don't you don't use the prefix here. So this next one is the file list. And those are the files that are gonna be copied for CPU one into um into the right directory for startup. So we got hello any.json space hello tbl.json. So this file has been updated. Then the next step, so we've updated those two commands. The next step is going to be the startup script, which is in the same directory. There it is. And I've made it convenient. If you've, if you've named it, yeah, um, hello, we can just uncomment. I left the line in there. You can just uncomment it. Now we'll go. Now we're ready to do the whole the whole build process again. So we can go to this, go to your CFS window. And if you just back up, you are going to do need to do a prep. Um, Oops. Oh, sorry, I'm still in the wrong directory. <laughs> so I got to go back to the base directory of the framework. Now I can do the simulation prep. And it found, you could see that it copied the hello world, the any tables, um, the tables, and it should have built. I will tr we'll trust that it built it since we're running a long time. Now we got to do a make. You can actually just do a make install and it'll do the make. It'll do the make first and then the install will do the copy of the files over. So it's now rebuilding the system. I'm hoping everybody else is able to try this and with even some of the hiccups. Now that that's successful, so we can go to the build x8 slash CPU one. And we should see that hello successfully replaced its table and hello app is initialized to version one. So we've got the hello app in. Um, we're gonna have to restart the ground system again because like before it needs to see that new module and it'll help clear out the errors <laughs> so so i can restart and if we go under here oh, we'll enable telemetry and if we go under the command we'll notice that there's a hello application now in the menu so we can bring up the hello telemetry. Um, so basically, if we get, we can race through this, I think. The hello world app has a really simple, um, it just counts up from some low limit to a high limit. And when it hits it, it'll reset it, the counter, and the counter has two modes, increment or decrement. So, um, so let's just, so if we, let's set the counter mode. Um, right now it's counting up from, I don't have the limits in telemetry, but it is zero to 100. So we could say, let's change it to decrement mode, and send the command. And we see the command counter go up by one, the, the counter mode changes to decrement and now it's going backwards. So. If, since we got, we do have the time. So the, the goal, the, the hands-on exercise, now that was all tool driven, but there is a, uh, let's see if we can open this. 
So lesson two of the hello world was to now let's modify this. So I got to go through a little bit of um, the open site kit framework and I hope, uh, so we're going to add an event message and we'll change some default table values. And part of this exercise is really just to highlight kind of that way the open site kit framework is structured. It's, it's got a, a very, it's an, I call it object based. So, and what I mean by that is it, it uses C, it's all in C, but um, C, every C file is treated like a C class in the sense, you know, you got your, you, you've got your data and you got your methods that operate on the data. And, and I literally call the, you know, a, file, a function constructor. And then every, every object could have a command if it wants, it could send telemetry. Um, and in this case, I have an execute function for the example object. So the hello world, the, the app is really just an aggregation or a collection of objects. And every object can be a collection of more objects. It's just a hierarchy of functional modules. And what I find is it keeps it very, it decouples the system. Um, the framework actually has a callback system. So you register your commands from all your objects and they just get called when the pipe gets read at the command level. So the applications and all the framework apps look very, very similar. Um, and they just have an init routine. They initialize the objects they own. And this object could initialize other objects. And, and it's really a very simple aggregation model that to me has worked out pretty well in terms of decoupling a system. So the hello world has these two files, has an example object, and the example object owns an example table. And if you notice like the set mode command is here, dump command, load command, and these just get registered by the main app. And there is a main app header file that coordinates all the function codes. So there is still some global aspect that way. So basically what we're gonna do is modify this execute function, executes in response to a, a one hertz execute message from the scheduler table that I went over. Um, oh, and I guess one other concept really, yeah, the, the, what I call business logic, you know, that's where you want your functionality of the app. It shouldn't be coupled in with the main app per se, you just, and it helps isolate changes. Um, from a C structure, what that means, you know, they all look, so it's just, here's framework stuff up, here's hello app. It's got framework objects. It's got a housekeeping packet and it's got its state data and contained objects. Then example objects, no different. If it had framework, typically they don't have framework things and I you know I can't get into detail, but it's got state data and it owns the class tape, the table. And then the table has its table data. And this is some state data for the JSON. So I am gonna rush through this a little bit because I'd love for you guys to try. So in the ex example object, here's the basic logic of the execute function. If you're in the increment mode and you're less than the high limit, then increment it. If you're in a decrement or then if you're not, or if you've hit the limit or about, then you reset it. Else you're in decrement mode, so you decrement if you're above the low limit, otherwise you reset. So just as an easy um, exercise, I'm recommending just put in an event message every time you set the limit. And what I did was say, you know, if I, I just hit the limit, I'm resetting it. Um, so first it says the mode is, you know, it describes the mode and there's a little utility function that gets a string. It's reached the high limit. It's resetting it to low limit. Um, and the backup, so I realized if you're not familiar with the CFS, the event message syntax is you got an ID, an event type, a format string, which is very much like a printf, hopefully if you're a C programmer, and then the values that are gonna be substituted in where the parentheses are. So I'm going to go over, and I can, and we can just do one of that message. Um, I'll, I'll show you. I know it's going to be a little quick to follow along. So here's our hello app, light software, source, example object. We can scroll down to the execute function, and now there's already a event message in here, so we can just cut and paste that. And I'm, you know what, I'm not even gonna, just to keep it simple and to avoid possible errors, 
first I'm going to change the event type to information because the debugs are not set up to come out right now. And maybe we'll just say, hit high limit. We can avoid a lot of extra typing. And Dave, just as a heads up, we got about five minutes. Okay, that's, yeah, and we'll cut and paste that. We'll say, hit load. I'm going to have to race through this. We'll have to, and we'll skip changing the table values. Well, now my cursor is acting up. I can't see it. <laughs> so I'm going to go back here, control C. I'm going to go back to the build. We shouldn't have to do the prep again. And actually, this time we won't have to restart the ground system. Oops, did that again. Because it, um, we didn't change any EDS. So let's go back to the main screen. So we still got to update. We have to enable telemetry because this is a new CFS version running. Oh, maybe we do. It didn't like, oh well. This might be tricky to do in five minutes. At least got to see the new event message come out. Yeah, this doesn't want to close. There we go. Okay, we'll start that. And I'm hoping some people are able to follow along. So this time we got the events. Oh, we didn't change the limits. So it's gonna take a hundred seconds. That's why I was changing the limits. <laughs> oh, oh well, I rushed too fast. So we won't see our event message uh, come out. Well, as we talk, so I don't know if there's any questions. Actually, I'll open it. Maybe it'll, if the hundred seconds will happen so we can see. Uh, We'll get to see our one event. I was part of the. So we're already up to 83 seconds. So when it gets to 100, we should see that new event message saying I hit. Um, but I think what I'll do is open up. Anybody have any questions? Um, I'll just leave it at that. And as we'll wait for the uh, event message to hear. I know that was a real <laughs> whirlwind. And it was challenging to try to, um, and there comes our event message. So we got the hit high limit event. It, but um, Dave, uh, two two quick things. One, sure. um, I this doesn't have to end here. Uh, if people want to or are working through this uh, over the course of the week, this is open source. Pull it down uh, and play with it. Um, and then there was a question from Payam. Uh, could you please comment on when we would build for CPU2? Uh, is that just a com management configuration to support multiple platforms or the same source code? Yeah, it's, um, yes, it's, it's there to support multiple targets. So you can configure, you know, if you got your embedded target and you're also running on your desktop, so CPU1 could be for your desktop and two could be for your target and they can pull in from the same you know, or a combination of different apps and libraries or however you want to mix it up. And actually that's a good question for like command ingest. That's a, a perfect example of this kind of build system. You know, on my desktop, you're using a command ingest that's done with UDP and packets and your target might be doing frames and depending on what it's talking to hardware wise. So you might actually load up a different app suite for your different targets. Um, but you want your core probably the same. Then one one last quick question: Is there any reason to leave Cosmos? Well, this is not a full blown um, uh, ground system by any means. <laughs> so, um, 
I know, and and personally, I want to take OpenSat Kit, the current version, and I'm going to put it out there. If there's a Cosmos people that are interested in supporting me, I, I haven't learned Cosmos five, and I'm looking forward to the uh, presentation on Thursday. But I'm running out a little bandwidth here, and um, I just haven't learned. It might be neat to have a little working group. But um, there's um, no, I mean, Cosmos is a great system, and it's just that they've made an architectural change. And in combination with the CFS, not having all its app suites updated at the same time as the framework, it's been convenient to just leave OpenSat Kit alone in its current form. But it really could, you know, use an upgrade and move on to the future of 5.0, Cosmos 5.0. Any other so much. questions or? I think we're. I don't know. Out of Could time, I open actually? it real quick? Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. It's going to give Joe. Sorry to put. Did you have anything, Joe? You want to say about the tool frame? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but Joe. So this really came out of. If we got two seconds, <laughs> um, go ahead. Not, I don't want to push that. Out, or if there's anything you want to say on the status, Joe, or I mean, because it's really. I want to thank you first, Joe, for making that publicly available, and it's been great. I mean, it's really. I think moving the technology forward. Um, no, I mean, not really. It's been a work in progress for, for quite some time. So um, I think it, it, it just serves as a convenient way as a desktop user to be able to get your uh, commands and telemetry and, and visualize it a little bit. And, uh, you know, just as a debugging tool and a, a, a development platform. And there's also a lot of opportunity to do you know, scripted tests and things like that with the, with the framework, having the language bindings and things like that, you could, you could really do a lot of things with it that can be interesting. Um, we have proof of concepts of a lot of those, but, um, you know, never, never really brought to fruition. All right. That's a good point. Right. For the onboard Python and Lua, I think you've done. Right. right. I forgot about that. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunities to meld it with, you know, one of the previous uh, presentations was regarding a lot of, uh, you know, machine learning and and that type of uh, software that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of off the shelf Python code that does that type of thing. So if you if you had that type of software and you wanted to hook it to your flight software, but you need to you know subscribe to a, a software bus telemetry message in order to to guide that that uh, algorithm, this these bindings give you the capability of doing all of that kind of stuff. Thanks. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. No, no problem. <laughs> all right. I think we are out of time now, but I think we are going to continue some of the discussion on the CFS-workshop uh, channel. And uh, as Chris mentioned, we can continue um, working through and answering questions and, and doing any discussion through the remainder of the week. So thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, Brandon. At, and, at the Flight Software Workshop. And everybody, thank you. Uh, and that's actually all that we have on the agenda for today. So thank you all for attending the first day of the Flight Software Workshop. We have another packed agenda for you uh, tomorrow, starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'll see you all then. Thank you very much.